Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Credit Verse. I'm Rod Griffin, Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian, and this is where we talk about everything uh, in the credit universe, the universal finance universe. Um, and I think Shelly just dropped off, but let me introduce Shelly Bell, my guest today. I'm really excited to have her with us. Uh, I'll, while she's reconnecting and, and we're struggling with the internet, so we'll make it work. Shelly is a systems disruptor. She's plays new ways of thinking in the educational, political, and finance systems. And bring her back in. And has scaled over 100 businesses. Let's, we'll start over. Uh, so I'm going to start wait for Shelly to come back, and then we'll jump in. There she is. So um, we'll, we're going to... The, the internet gods are not being kind today. They did it to me earlier. <laughs> so, yeah, the strangest thing. I'm like, I'm here. Wait. <laughs> okay. We'll make it work. I'm going to jump in and start all over. <laughs> so, okay. so you're here. Uh, so the important person is on camera. Um, so again, welcome to the Credit Universe. I'm Rod Griffin, Senior Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. This is where we talk about everything in the credit and personal finance universe. I'm really excited today to have with me Shelly Bell, the CEO and founder of Black Girl Ventures, and many other things. Let me, I brought notes today so I could read your bio, most of your bio. Uh, the whole thing would take our whole 20 or 30 minutes. So Shelly is a systems disruptor. She's blazed new ways of thinking in the educational, political, and financial systems and has scaled over 100 businesses across sectors. She's worked as a K through 12 educator. God bless you for that. Uh, a, a patent examiner, a spoken word artist, and is a computer scientist and nonprofit executive. Between creating the first TP for women on Airbnb, which I want to know more about, launching a business as a single mom of three, and building tech platforms for equitable financial capital, Shelley practices the mantra she preaches to resist being average, and clearly you are well above average. Her most recent disruption, Black Girl Van. Ventures Foundation transforms entrepreneurship by reimagining the way black and brown women founders get access to financial and social capital. She was named one of the 100 most powerful women in business by Entrepreneur Magazine and acknowledged as a rising brand star by Adweek. She's been featured in Forbes, Fast Company, Yahoo Finance, Inc. Magazine, Politico Live, The Wall Street, The Washington Business Journal, and others. She's on the board of the Malika and, and Color of uh, Crohn's or Crohn's and chronic illness, Crohn's disease, I'm familiar with. Um, I have a daughter who, who suffers from it and founder of SheRaise.com. Shelly is the host of A Dose of Disruption, which I had the honor of being on uh, recently. So thank you for that. It's a podcast that helps leaders resist the urge to be average by disrupting their thought patterns and self-talk. And that's really what this is all about, to learn from each other and to hear from perspectives that we may not experience. So, Shelly, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. This is great. And, you know, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I listened to your story on the podcast. You didn't actually get to listen to mine. Ah. Yours is better than mine, or at least more interesting, I think. So, <laughs> we, and I, you know, I want to know more. How did you get started? I mean, where, where did this passion come from? And, and how did you bring it to such an, an, an amazing place? Yeah, great question. So um, I'll tell you the TP story. All right. So <laughs> I've gotten laid off twice. So, I mean, as you read, I've lived a lot of lives. Um, I was a teacher. I've done, you know, trademark, patent and trademark work. I, you know, I, I started my own art organization. I caught myself a private eye at one point. Like that, that's you know, I am all about the grit and the grind, the hustle to get where you're trying to go, okay, uh, legally. Yeah. And so <laughs> I had gotten laid off twice, like almost back to back. And I said, you know what? And, and for different reasons, it had nothing to do with me. And so I said, you know what? I'm not going back to work for anyone. I refuse. I'm done. Um, the last time I was laid off, I was devastated. I called California Psychics. And I was like, what is happening to my life? And the psychic, she told me, when you find a thing that you want to do, the money will come. And so I'm like, okay, that was hopeful. So I uh, decided, I threw everything out of my living room. I'm like, I'm going to start a business. And so I um, didn't quite, you know, at first it didn't quite go that smooth. <laughs> 
I had, I came up with a couple of different things. So the first thing was a TP. I built a TP and put it in my living room. And I said, I'm going to build a TP, put it in my living room. And I'm going to rent it out. Right. And everybody thought I was crazy. I didn't even know how to drill a hole at the time. I was at Home Depot gathering wood and they're like, what are you doing? Um, and I told them I'm going to build a TP, put it in my living room and I'm going to rent it out. Um, and I did. And Airbnb has a TP option. Right. And so that it actually worked. Wow. Um, but after I let one person come and stay, I quickly realized that I didn't want people sleeping in my living room in a TP. And <laughs> so I'm like, I got to pivot. Um, and so I started thinking about other skills that I have. And I learned to do T-shirts at a previous job. And so I launched a T-shirt line. The first one sucked. Nobody bought it. And then the second one, I was on the phone with a printer I was working with. And I said to him, you know what? It's made by a black woman. I should put that on a shirt. And so I literally went to the computer and I designed the Made in America logo. Uh, I'm the Made by a Black Woman logo. It's a pattern after the Made in America logo. And people loved it. And so my mom, she invested some of her um, retirement. I used my tax returns to buy my own machines. And there I was, you know, building my own print shop and having my own T-shirt line. And so I'm um, traveling up and down the East Coast doing these T-shirts. I had um, through just built a relationship, started doing orders for like Google and Amazon for merch. So I really leveled up my business. This is where I learned about business credit. This is where I learned about supply diversity. This is where I learned about like leverage, you know, being able to uh, leverage my machines if I needed to, which is one of the reasons why I made that choice. Like people don't always think about buying assets. Um, a lot of things you do when you're starting a business are just feel like all risk and just pouring in, pouring in, pouring in. Um, and then, you know, but one of the things I read was, oh, you know, I can actually leverage my equipment if I need to. So I'm going to buy equipment. Um, I also learned a little bit about like business credit um, and, and credit in a way where getting with your suppliers, developing a relationship where you could do 30 day net. You know, like that was everything for me because when you are doing supplier diversity and we can get deeper into this later if you want, but when you're doing supply diversity or and not supply diversity, but when you're a supplier, right. you're working, you get a larger customer. The customer could be a corporation, could be the government. And you sometimes have to ha be able to fare 60, 30 days, 60 days into your procurement pays you out. Yeah. And so being able to have your manufacturing partners or people you're working with um, to be able to give you 30 day net so that you can get those orders in and get that job done is everything. Yeah. But again, that's building a relationship. Like that is really what credit meant for me during that time, you know, on top of like leveraging credit cards to pay bills, is, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, not the leverage you want. But you, that's something you know I talk about a lot too. Is when we think about personal credit, if people think about it like a business does, credit's a tool, and it's a financial tool that can help them succeed. And I think that's a perfect example of you know you are an amazing person who took a chance and learned how to use business credit as a tool, and and you've applied that to personal credit too. It's how do you leverage something to your benefit and not let debt be become the problem. I mean, I think that's brilliant. Mm. And, um, you know, and, and, but the willingness to take risks is, I don't think I have that to that level. <laughs> so this is, and this is why I think that we have to lean into art because being an artist being a creator, actually gives you the permission to imagine what could happen if you take this risk. Yeah. So right. I, I think. And you said something else too. You said, you know, when you learned about leverage you, and kind of had some success with the first, with your business, it gave you hope. And I think that's, that's such an important word that, you know, when people have hope, they can accomplish so much. Um, so here's the hard question. How do we give them hope? Because I think that's what you're about. And that's what Black Girl Ventures is about. You know, uh, this is what, oh, I'm sorry. 
No, go ahead. This is what I tell people. There is something that you have done that you didn't know how to do and you did it anyway. So for me, I had done many things I didn't know how to do before, like raise kids. But I had, <laughs> but one of the things was after that, after I built that teepee and made it work, I said, oh, I can make anything work. I still believe it. Anytime I have a hard day, I say to myself, if I can get people to sleep in a teepee, I could do anything. And, so, and we all have those moments. You know, if I could get that job, I could do anything. If I could, you know, uh, improve my credit to get that car, if I could um, raise those kids, if I could take that trip, you know, plan that trip the way I planned it and, and without any capital at first, if I could, like, you have to find your, ooh, that thing, I can do anything. Like, that, you know, pass that class, take, you know, get that degree, go, you know, live, sometimes live in that neighborhood or, you know, like those types of things to pull on, they don't have to all be negative experiences either. You know, it's just times when you solve such a key problem right. that you thought was even crazy yourself to solve. You know, that is how I, I tell people like, keep that key problem that you're solving core. So, so here's another thing about me. A lot of people center the why. I don't necessarily center my why all the time. I'm a, I like to, I'm a, um, I'm, I like to disrupt things and I like to put pieces of puzzles together. So I center my how. My why is pretty like core to who I am. Like I want to see the world be a better place. I want to see people get access to more information. I want to see people get access to more capital. I don't want my six-year-old daughter, you know, 20 years from now, still having to have the same conversation about access. The work I'm doing has to do with that. And I'm inspired by looking at the communities that I see around me that are resilient, right? Yeah. At the same time, I'm always thinking about how. So so for, you know, moving forward in the story, how I built about Black Girl Ventures or how it came about was because the news came out. Okay, Black women are not getting access to capital. So Black women are starting businesses at six times the national average. This is pre-pandemic yet receiving less than 1% of venture capital. And I went, okay. <laughs> I know that journey firsthand. Like my mom used her retirement to invest in my business. And I use my tax returns to invest in my business. And I use every side hustle I could think. I, I was a substitute teacher during this time. I, um, I, I did technical writing for some um, contractors, for government contractors during this time. I did, I did spoken word, I hosted events. I did a lot of different little hustles and during that time to infuse capital into my business, right? And so I'm like, oh, okay, I know this journey firsthand. So let me just pull some people together, throw some money in a hat and give it away. And that's how Black Girl Ventures started. 30 women in a house in Southeast DC, uh, we came together, four women pitched their business. We voted with marbles and coffee mugs. If you like that person's pitch, you put your marble in their coffee mug. And people liked it. And so I said, well, let's keep doing it. Um, and just again, as a problem solver, just started thinking of systems, ways to put it together. Uh, eventually, now today, we've built, I've built my own software to handle voting and donating, which is, which is essentially... Um, like Kickstarter and crowdfunding, put I mean, Kickstarter and Shark Tank put together. Yeah. So people pitch, and then you actually can vote with your dollars. Um, you know, activating civic participation, democratizing capital. Like, how can we get more people involved in the process? Uh, we have funded 130 women. We have efforts across 12 cities right now, um, and we're the largest entrepreneur support organization for Black and Brown women founders on the East Coast. Wow. So talk a little bit about capital, uh, because that, you know, in in the research you've done, that's a huge barrier to getting the business off the ground and, and keeping it afloat. Um, where do you turn? What are those barriers? How do we overcome them? 
I mean, it's kind of big questions, but um, you know, that's the how do we solve that? That's the one I want to get to. Uh, but how you know how do we do that? And I think we have to recognize the barriers first, and then figure out what they are. So, and then how to overcome them. So, what are your thoughts there? How do you know what are the barriers? Uh, at least some of them. And then how do you, what do we do to to come together to tear them down? Yeah, so the barriers, well, some of the challenges that underrepresented founders face is access to capital, financial capital, influence, influence, access to influential networks, and the ability to hire. And if you ask me, I think all of those come down to um, influential networks, mm -hmm. and which makes the root of the problem, what well, makes the problem and the continuous like not being able to solve the problem a little bit challenging because it's all about people, right? I mean, the numbers will tell you the the um, the advances, the economic advancements of working with people of color or diverse people. So, you know, having a woman on your board increases your revenue, um, also makes you less risky. Having a, um, you know, having a person of color uh, on your team also can you know make sure more money like the numbers are out there the research is out there around how diversity uh helps you become more equitable but at the core of this challenge is just the human spirit and whether or not we want to make change or see places where the change is up to us i think like ownership and accountability so so you know I don't necessarily want to get stuck on us continuously, not us here, but just in general as a society. Um, just like always trying to figure out like who to blame. I think that like there's nuances to the kinds of conversation we need to have that we just haven't been comfortable enough to have yet. And so, you know, when you think about um, billions of dollars going into venture capital and then eventually being invested, but only like 0.67, I think it was, percent of that going to black founders. It's kind of like, okay, so, I mean, that, that's just a problem, you know? Um, I think the solution is going to be time, but time in a very specific and intentional direction of conversation, yeah. open conversation. I think there could be some a mix of mandates and, um, I don't want to be overly mandated, but I would say right. it could be a mix of mandates and influence and um, incentives yeah. that, but it, here's the thing, you know, what's interesting about incentives is that like incentivizing a company, a corporation or, you know, company to have diverse candidates on their boards and teams is incentivizing them to make more money. Because by having those people on your boards and teams, you're going to make more money. And it's like, is that not an incentive for you? So like on one hand, yeah. So anyway, I could go, I'm, I'll let you ask me more questions, but you know, it's just so interesting for us to have to incentivize when, if, if the Fortune 1000 is saying, you know, Hey, you know, I'm going to, um, I want to, it's about the money. Then it, you know, or, or revenue. Uh, then I, I find that hard to believe, considering that um, diversity brings you more revenue. Yeah, and and I think you know, we have to be deliberate, and it, as you said, intentional. Um, it's an odd. It's odd isn't the right word, but it's a. I guess a place where we are that it should shouldn't we shouldn't have to have this conversation. It we should just you know what I mean, and it's. But we're at a place where we need to listen to each other and be purposeful and thoughtful and intentional. Um, you know, and I think Experian is trying to do that, um, you know, and, and I think that's critical. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm proud of our company for doing that because it's it opens the conversations. Like you said, we have to talk and we have to listen. We have to learn from each other and then figure out how to tear down those barriers because they're not going anywhere if we don't. Right. So. That, I love having these conversations. Um, when we talk about, uh, you've mentioned some of the statistics uh, and looking at, and I made, like I said, I made notes because 
<laughs> Usually we just have conversation. I'm going, I want to add no specific things. Um, what tips do you have for minority women in particular, but people in general, I think that your knowledge is incredible. Interested in starting their own business. What, where do they go? I mean, a TP in the living room is amazing. Uh, I, my wife and daughters and granddaughters would stay there if you still had it. <laughs> so, you know, I'm going to have to go build more. I keep saying yeah. I'm going to build some and maybe sell them or something as, I've told the story so many times and I have like a picture of it, like way down in my Instagram timeline. It's actually a pretty fun activity. So it could be a team building thing or a family moment where everybody's in the house. Um, where should people go? So when I think that you should approach it like a science experiment, you know, and I mean, go back to the old school way that you learned in science uh, how to, you know, do a science experiment. Just, you know, it's just what is your hypothesis? How do you test it? What are your variables and your constants? Like, that is really the most simplest way to build a business. And then after you start to dig into your planning and what you're going to do, what you want to do, and, and like testing your uh, assumptions, because that's key. You can test your testing your assumptions doesn't mean you just got to jump off. You know, like I, I do believe that you should have enough faith in yourself to jump off the cliff and build a parachute on the way down. I'm also not saying that's what you have to do. I'm saying it is completely okay if you go and search, do customer discovery first. You know, have your hypothesis, go out, ask 50 people questions to determine what to test your hypothesis. And I say that because a lot, sometimes you can build a business in a direction that nobody's really asking for, but like two people that you know. <laughs> and then you're like, oh, but, but me and my friends, and just because you and your friends said, I mean, you and your friends will buy it. And those are two different things. The other thing that I would say is, so that's one, you know, put your scientific method in play, you know, have a hypothesis, test your assumptions, um, then build. The next thing is know that revenue is the validator, not your best friend's aunt's cousin who really, who never run a business before, but all of a sudden got an opinion on what you're about to do. They're not the validator, not the VC who doesn't see the benefit in investing in your kind of company, you, you as a person, they're not the validator. The bank is not a validator. The, like validate yourself. Okay, and you do that by like focus on revenue. The third thing I would say is like be patient with yourself. I know that the internet makes things feel like everything is moving fast. It's actually not, not even media. <laughs> like so many things are moving fairly slow. And I guess slow for this day and age is longer than a day, it seems. But um, you know, be patient with yourself. Because sometimes we look at other people's journey and we'll be like, oh, man, they're so far along. And they're actually not. They're just making it look like they're far along. Yeah. So, you know, have your hypothesis, test your assumptions, and then plan, and then build. Um, you know, revenue is the validator. Remember that. And then three, just be have some patience with yourself. And I think, and like you said, it, it, what about failing? You know, Do you ever fail? I, because I don't think you've ever failed, right? You know, it, it's it's something you tried something it didn't work like you planned, and then you found something else to do, and you learned from that, right? One hundred percent. I think that failure is a mechanical term, and it should not be uh, an attribute of uh, people, right? Mm -hmm. So, like. Yeah, I remember somebody said to me, like, businesses don't fail, the owners give up. And at some point, you, it may be something you should give up on, right? Like, at, like yeah. after the TP got up and running, I'm like, oh, this is going to take more than I want to do right now because I need to make money. Um, I, it didn't fail. I just decided not to do it anymore. And at some point, you decide, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to lose this amount of capital anymore. I'm not going to invest this amount of capital anymore. I'm not, but that's not a, in my, in my opinion, it's not a failure. It's an admission of what you've learned and that it's time to move on. It's an awareness that you've done all you can do here and it's time to go. And that is a highly 
social, emotional, and intelligent thing to be able to do. So I, I don't I don't look at it as failure. I don't look at things as like you a pass fail. Right. Yeah. yeah. You only fail if you don't learn and use that and what you've learned to move forward. So, it, and I know that's one of those cliche things, but I, I, that's why I kind of love talking to you because you embody that. It's it's like, what's next, right? Learn something here. What's the next thing? And it's and it's that hope. I mean, it's such a wonderful message. Um, how can the community, wh whoever the community is, support? women entrepreneurs and and how where where does where is the community who is the community and how do how do i think i'm part of that community where who do, how do we help right yeah i mean you know it's funny because when i say my people uh it might be assumed that I, that i only mean black people and <laughs> but when i say my people i'm typically saying people who get it like people who get what i'm doing you know, it could be black people, LGBT allies, like it is people, women, men, like it is people who get what you get you, you know, those are your people. Um, community is similar for me, is the people who get it. Now, of course, you know, community has different definitions like proximity. Um, and we define it that way in some instances of Black Girl Ventures. But it's also just like the people who are like all around, you know, they're watching, they're cheering, they're participating. Um, it's community. So, yes, I would say you're a part of that community. The way that through Black Girl Ventures that you can support community, the Black, you know, Black and Brown founders is to, you know, follow, like, become a part of our uh, pitch competition, like attend them, vote with your dollars for the founders, pitch that you like best. You can donate. Um, in general, to to support underrepresented groups of founders, you could buy from them. If you are inside of a corporation working, you could also ask or push for that corporation to become a customer of them. So you could be a customer and you could push someone else, including your company, to be a, a customer. Right. And that gives them a whole other level, of, another level of capital. Um, so those are ways also, you know, don't discount the, the value of a like, follow and a share, like all of those things help like keep people's efforts going, keep their products moving throughout, uh, the country, uh, getting them like visibility is always great. I mean, even things like this, having people on here to be able to interview them and giving them visibility is huge. Cool. Great. So make yourself part of the community if you if you're not sure if you are so that's right yeah so it's, it takes action on the individual's part too um where and you know i could stay on for hours but i don't want to hold you forever so how can so another question and i don't know we've covered it completely how can black and brown entrepreneurs obtain access to capital to grow their business i mean you know Black Girl Ventures is potentially one source, but where yeah. else can they go? I would I would tell people to uh, consider the full definition of capital. You know, that's first. And then you want to map out what you need according to your phase. So, like, you may need certain levels of capital or kinds of capital at certain phases. And there's different kinds of capital. So there's human capital, natural capital, manufacturing capital, social capital, financial capital, right? All of these kinds of capital are key, but you got, what do you need? So number one, what do you need? You might need a loan. You might be going out there trying, you know, wanting to get investment, but haven't, you know, proved viable enough to a certain extent to get invested to really bite. You might need a loan. You might need a line of credit. Lines of credit is something that it's not talked about often in the black community and the ways that lines of credit can be used and leveraged and shared even um, is not talked about at all across uh, the black community. Um, and so like thinking about how you use your business credit uh, as well. So what kind of, what do you need to leverage to get to the next uh, place in your business? And then, you know, ultimately build a business that makes money. 
So when you are getting the capital and putting it in, you are actually able to see a return. Investors and funders want to see that you have done the work of investing in yourself before they invest in you because you are the first one to determine where the return is, not us. Yeah. Awesome. So one last question. Where can people learn more about Black Girls Ventures? And where can they find you and the Dose of Disruption podcast? Where do they go to learn more from you? Yeah, thank you for that. So you can go to www.blackgirlventures.org to uh, follow Black Girl Ventures and Instagram at Black Girl Ventures, Twitter at B Girl Ventures. To follow Shelly Bell movements, you can go, I am Shelly Bell everywhere. So I A M S H E L L Y B is in boy E L L. I'm Shelly Bell. That's my handle on Twitter, Instagram. Um, you can also go to I am Shelly Bell.com or a dose of disruption.com to, um, excuse me, to, to follow and listen to the podcast. Definitely um, go and listen. Rod's um, episode is amazing. So just like, I, I had someone actually send me a note saying, oh, I, I'm so glad I listened to that episode. I realized I'm doing so many things right. Awesome. That's the best kind of, kind of response. That's that reaffirm hope, right? Cool. Cool. I'm glad we, have, I'm, I'm always glad when we can help people. I mean, that's, that's the, the joy I think. And I, and I tell people I have the best job at Experian because I get to talk to people like you and we get to share information that help people every day. So that that's the, the, the best thing that you can do. So that's awesome. Um, to find me, I don't, I don't have all of those things. <laughs> so I need an, I am Rod Griffin. Um, I didn't follow that lead. That's uh, such but, a good thing. You should do it. Yeah. I am Rod Griffin. That's we'll it. We'll get there. Uh, so, but I work for Experian. So, <laughs> the, so you can find us at, uh, hashtag credit chat and hashtag credit chat live. If you go to ex.pn slash credit chat or ex.pn slash credit chat live, you can find this conversation. We're on Crowdcast as well. Search for us there and, and follow this conversation on Facebook live uh, and visit experience.com and you'll find all sorts of education resources, materials and, and information to help you be more successful which is what this is all about. So Shelly, thank you so much for your knowledge and wisdom and experience and the offer of hope. Thank I think that's you. so important. So thank you so much for being part of, of our credit universe and, and our credit chat live today. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more in the future. Take care. All right. Thank you.